Howdy, folks! I'm still trying to find or detect gold in these two bags of gold ore that were purchased at a gifty, touristy sort of shop. Do they really have gold ore? Do they really contain gold? Or is they just a couple bags of rocks? Well, let's continue to look. I'm not about to make any firm judgment yet. And the method I want to use is in my well-worn-out book. It's the Identification and Qualitative Chemical Analysis of Minerals by Orsino Smith. And it's quite an interesting fire assay method. Uh, the two things that make it interesting is that it uses a very small volume. It uses only about two-tenths of a milliliter of crushed sample, or about two-tenths of a gram. Uh, the second thing that's interesting about the method is nothing is weighed. So you don't need a very delicate balance. Uh, even today with the electronic scales and everything, it's still difficult to weigh these really small quantities. So actually what, the, what it does is you take the sample and you add a flux to it, a lead-based flux, and all of the gold and precious metal goes into the lead that forms, and you separate that out, and then you get rid of the lead through uh, cupellation or scorification and then you're left with a very tiny bead and you actually measure the diameter of the bead with a set of special calipers which gives you instructions on how to build and they're, they're, they're kind of a cross here but they're offset with the pivot 10 to 1 so when you measure measure the tip diameter or distance between the two tips on this end it's magnified 10 times on the other end and you use a calibrated wedge to figure out exactly what that uh, uh, measurement is uh, by a factor of 10. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I do have a microscope with a reticulated eyepiece that I'm able to measure accurately depending on what magnification I'm looking and would make it a lot easier. But anyways it's still kind of an ingenious method. And He claims that even lean ores you should be able to get a very 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 tiny bead somewhere in the process. Here is a picture of some of the tools uh, in the book. Uh, actually they say to build a scoop so you don't have to weigh anything. They say to use the end of a thermometer bulb uh, and uh, put it on a handle as a scoop to measure out the sample and corresponding uh, other materials. This is actually a diagram for making a mold to make your own cupels uh, out of bone ash. I have some that I bought so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, this is the proportional tongs. You actually measure the bead with the very fine opening here. And this is the pivot point and it's a 10 to 1 ratio so you actually uh, measure the opening here to find the diameter of the bead. And to measure this opening you actually use a calibrated wedge which they give a diagram here, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, like I said, use the uh, reticulated microscope to be able to that has a scale on it to be able to measure a bead. So that'll make things a bit simpler. Here's the formula for the flux that they use. It's five parts of sodium bicarbonate, four parts of potassium carbonate. I didn't have any potassium carbonate, so I used sodium. So I hope that works fine. A borax glass, which is actu actually uh, sodium tetraborate or borax that's been melted and uh, into a glass and crushed up, and that's two parts by weight. Uh, plain old uh, wheat flour, I think when they say wheat they just mean white flour, one part, and litharge, uh, six parts, and litharge I believe is a uh, lead oxide. Here's a graph showing the size of the bead versus the amount of gold that's in there. Now, there's no way you're going to really be able to read this because I could barely read it in person, but I just wanted to uh, give you a, kind of a visual of it. I didn't have an appropriate size scoop, so I made one. This is actually the plastic cap to a pen, and I'll put a little handle on it. But it's supposed to be about two-tenths of a milliliter, and the sample should be about two-tenths of a gram. So I'm going to wait out just to, just to uh, check it out. I think it's the volume here is a little light. I think it's about 0.16. Okay, so that's one scoop. And even though the volume's a little lighter or smaller, the the amount of sample is a little bit higher. It's about 0.27 grams. Alright, so, so I have 
exactly a half a gram a sample. You need to put in two scoops of flux for every scoop of sample. And I have two scoops of the sample, so I'm going to put in four scoops of the flux. And I'm going to use the, the hood because there is lead in here. So that's four. I'm going to mix this up really well and even uh, kind of grind it together. All right, we should have really good mix, mixture of the flux in the sample and in really good contact. You're supposed to use a charcoal block and make an indentation for the sample to sit in. I'm actually using a charcoal briquette, which will work just fine. And uh, you put your flux and sample mixture into that indentation. You first melt it and then you hit it with the strong flame to coalesce the lead globules together. But you have to be gentle because the stuff has a tendency to want to blow away. It looks like I have it all melted. So I'm going to go ahead and start heating it with a very strong flame. Okay, I can't really see any lead uh, globules or anything coalescing. So I'm going to assume they're at the bottom of the slag there. But I think I got this hot enough. It says something about pouring the molten slag off of the lead or vice versa. Well, I think I do see a piece of metal in there. Yeah, there's a bunch of lead under there. Here's our melted slag. I wasn't able to separate while, separate it from the lead while it was hot, so I'm going to break it up and look for the, the lead pieces in there. Alright, I see them in there. I'm going to have to separate those out by hand here. I looked at the fusion that we made with the flux in the sample and when I was heating it you can actually see a lot of very small global globules of lead but they're really tiny uh, in the slag but they didn't really seem to move around or coalesce uh, I think the viscosity of the slag was really too great for the heavier lead to, to drop down uh, I did take the bead out and, the, and crushed it and there are a couple little pieces that maybe I could kind of separate, but there were a lot of very tiny specks of lead that there was no way I was going to be able to uh, mechanically, physically get those together. So, I didn't get this on camera, but what I did is I actually added just a little bit more flux. And I also added something called fluorspar, which is actually fluorite, or calcium fluoride. So the word fluorite actually came from the root floor, which is either Greek or Latin or something, which means to flow. They actually used it way back when, uh, in early days of smelting, to reduce the viscosity of different fluxes and, and melts and stuff. So, so I have some fluorite. I ground a little bit of that up, so I added that to the sample and to a little bit of the flux and I heated that and I did see uh, got some material uh, one bead I can actually see with the naked eye and some other pieces that I was able to get together the next step is supposedly a scorification process where you actually put the lead bead and add some powdered borax glass and you're supposed to heat that and that's supposed to suck some of the lead out of there too and end up with a really fine bead. You know, it's hard to break this apart from the slag being so small. Uh, you know, you grab it with tweezers and it just flies off into the air or even try to move it with a needle. Uh, so I'm going to actually take what I have and I'm going to put it right in the coupel and we're going to heat the bejeebies out of this, hopefully draw out the lead and see if we get uh, a bead left over that might be some precious metal into it. This is what I got after heating it in the coupel. And I think that's still lead because it was soft after it was cooling for a while. I'm going to try this again. Except this time I'm going to use uh, some ground fluorite or floor spar to decrease the viscosity of the flux. So I'm going to add that to the flux. 
I have some here already. And maybe that'll allow those lead globules to, to sink a little bit easier and coalesce a little bit easier. I'm also going to use the amount that the reference recommended for the sample size. So instead of doubling it up to two scoops, I'm just going to use one scoop. This is the scorification step. I put a little bit of ground borax and the couple metal pieces there, and I'm going to heat them. It looks like the metal ball is right on the side of the borax. I don't have the knack for this fire assay method yet. I've done it a number of times and I'm not able to get a metal bead the first time through. I usually have to crush the, sl the slag and uh, maybe add some floor spar uh, to the flux to make it a little bit uh, lower viscosity. And then I'm able to get a bead. And it, it's about, the, the metal is about a millimeter, uh, maybe slightly bigger in size. So it's a really small bead. And then when I go through the scorification process and the cupellation to get rid of the lead, uh, the bead doesn't really change size, so, and it's still a silver color. So I'm not sure what's happening. I think there's still quite a bit of lead in there. It's really soft. It'll, I can indent it really easy with the needle. It'll scratch really easy. Uh, and there's no gold color to it. So my guess is it's uh, lead, but I guess it could be one of the other precious metals too. So what I think I'll do is I'll take one of them small beads and try to dissolve it in nitric acid. And if it's lead or silver, it will dissolve. Gold will not dissolve in, in the nitric. And uh, see what happens there. And I might end up throwing in some hydrochloric to, to make a uh, aqua regia then if it doesn't completely dissolve. And that maybe I'll test for with stannous chloride to see if there's gold in there. So. Let's give that a try. I have one of the very small beads in here. And I'm going to add, add some nitric acid and see if it dissolves. I'm going to just add a drop. It didn't really doesn't seem to be doing much. I'm going to add a little bit of hydrochloric to make the aqua regia. We're getting a little bit of a color change. Well, that's, uh, that's a good sign. You know, I have very little acid in here. I'm trying to keep the, the concentrations high. so. When I do add stannous chloride, I'll be able to see an indication even if the gold is at a very low level. Only part of the metallic bead from the fire assay dissolved here, but it should be enough. I put a couple drops in the spot plate here so it's a little bit easier to see any color. And I'm going to add the stannous chloride solution to see if we get a dark, darker color, purplish red, uh, if there's gold there. If there's some color there, I, I really can't pull it out very easily. So I guess the fire assay didn't work either. All right, I'm going to take a little bit, uh, just a drop of the solution or so, from each one of these. Let's add the stannous chloride. Nothing. As I expected, the fire assay was a difficult procedure. I did it a number of times, so I feel comfortable on repeating some of the uh, running into the same issues that I did over and over. Uh, the first one was it was very difficult to get the lead from the flux to coalesce into one bead. You had to heat it at least twice. Uh, the second time helped if you were able to separate some of the smaller pieces of lead together and throw out some of the glass from the flux. It also helped to put in some floor spar, which seemed to reduce the viscosity and helped the, the bead to coalesce. Now the beads that I did get, I put through the, uh, in a cupel and did the scorification step, but they didn't seem to reduce in size, and they were much too big to actually be a precious metal from the amount of sample. So it looks like there's a lot of lead, and the beads were very soft, and they were silver, except for some of them had kind of a, a goldish tinge on the bottom but that I think didn't have anything to do with with gold in the in the bead if, if there was gold dissolved in the lead it would be dispersed throughout the whole bead so I don't think the that coloration was just on the surface uh, a surface phenomenon
then the beads that I did get, uh, for what I can dissolve in, in acid and aqua regia, I couldn't detect gold in, in those. And that could be reasonable just for the amount of dilution for the very small sample that I took. Uh, so basically this, this method for me is inconclusive. It definitely needs more work. Maybe my coupel isn't the, the right kind. Maybe I'm not getting hot enough. Maybe I need an oven. We have some actually inconsistent results. The extraction methods that we tried in the, the one video didn't detect any gold. The uh, oxidation melt uh, method that we did did show gold. And uh, this one is inconclusive, so we have one of each. So for the next video, it's gonna, I have one more trick up my sleeve, and it's going to give us a definitive answer. So, and we'll finally be done with these gold videos, and I'll be able to go on to some, some other uh, topics here. So anyways, thanks for watching the video, and stay tuned for the final conclusion of the exciting saga of whether there is actually gold in, in, this, uh, in this ore.